in the secretive corners of the world, where shadows are cast not by the shifting of the sun, but by the veils of tyranny and oppression, there exists a realm that chills the bones of collective human conscience, North Korea. Behind the impenetrable curtains of the regime, beneath the grand parades and the exacting gaze of dictators, lie tales of unimaginable horror and sorrow. Since the ascension of the Kim dynasty, inaugurated by Kim Il-sung in 1948 and perpetuated through the unyielding grip of his descendants, a darkness has consumed the land. Can you fathom the torment within the gulags where humanity's flame is mercilessly snuffed out? Can your heart grasp the weight of suffering endured by the countless souls caught in the grinding gears of this diabolical machinery? Walls and wires mark the boundaries of places like Camp 22 and Horyong Concentration Camp, infamous theatres of atrocity where the stage is set for torture, starvation and death. These are the unhallowed grounds where despair blossoms and where the human spirit is tested against the cruelest edges of reality. The saga of Otto Warmbier, a young American, echoes with the grim testament of the regime's brutal machinery of punishment. His fate, a haunting whisper of the ruthlessness that prevails within the hidden corners of the North Korean system. Drawing inspiration from the profound reflections of Mahatma Gandhi, the only devils in the world are those running in our own hearts. That is where the battle should be fought. Do these words not resound with a poignant relevance, urging us to confront the terrifying demons that orchestrate the ruthless symphonies of suffering within North Korea's dreaded domains? Join us on a grim voyage as we peel back the shrouds of secrecy that cloak the forbidding terrains of North Korea, daring to unveil the relentless torrents of terror that flow through its hidden valleys of despair. Welcome to the diary of Julius Caesar. Whispers in the Hermit Kingdom, the veiled saga of human rights in North Korea. In the aftermath of World War II, as the Korean peninsula found itself partitioned between the North and the South, the foundations of North Korea's human rights journey were being laid. With the establishment of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in 1948 under the leadership of Kim Il-sung, the nation's trajectory was set. Kim Il-sung, often revered as the eternal president, began consolidating power, molding the nation's ideology around Jush, or self-reliance. While this ideology celebrated autonomy and self-sufficiency, it also became a means to suppress dissent and prioritize state control. Pyongyang, the heart of North Korea, bore witness to the country's early efforts to craft a national identity. Streets lined with towering statues of Kim Il-sung echoed the state's propaganda, while whispers of dissenters being taken away in the dead of night began to circulate. Anecdotes from this era tell tales of families living in fear, careful not to utter a word against the regime lest they find themselves in the infamous Yodok camp or other detention facilities. One can't delve into this history without mentioning the Korean War of the early 1950s. As North and South Korea grappled for dominance, tales of atrocities on both sides filled the air. Soldiers from the North recounted being ordered to eliminate entire villages suspected of collaborating with the enemy. Simultaneously, Stories from the South spoke of North Korean prisoners being denied basic human rights, a grim foreshadowing of things to come. As the decades rolled on, the DPRK further tightened its grip on its citizens. The 1970s saw the rise of Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung's son. Under his leadership, the Songbun system, a socio-political classification determining one's loyalty to the state, became deeply ingrained. This system, based on one's family history and political leanings, decided everything from job opportunities to food rations. A curious fact about the Songbun system is its intricate categorization, with citizens being classified into 51 different groups, ranging from the core loyal class to the hostile class. This system became a tool to maintain loyalty to the regime and punish generations for the perceived sins of their ancestors. While the world moved forward, embracing globalization in the late 20th century, North Korea further isolated itself. A haunting quote from this era by a North Korean defector, Kang Chol Hwan, encapsulates the nation's plight. In North Korea, life only gets worse, never better. 
Kang, who spent a decade in the Yodok camp, later wrote about the harrowing conditions and human rights mistreatments he witnessed. The turn of the millennium saw another shift in leadership. Kim Jong-un, the young and enigmatic leader, took the reins in the 2010 SS following his father's demise. While many hoped for a thaw in North Korea's stance on human rights, such optimism was short-lived. The country's nuclear ambitions overshadowed concerns about its human rights record. Satellite images of sprawling prison camps, testimonies of defectors, and reports of public executions painted a grim picture. Amidst this bleak landscape, there were moments of resilience and hope. The North Korean people, in their quiet ways, sought to reclaim their rights. Smuggled radios brought news from the outside world, while secret markets, known as Jiangmadang, became hubs for trade and information exchange. These markets, although illegal, thrived with the tacit approval of local officials, often bribed to turn a blind eye. Shadows behind the mountains, the unspoken chronicles of Kwanliso, nestled amidst the rugged terrains of North Korea, far from the prying eyes of the outside world, lies a network of secret detention facilities, the Kwanliso. These political prison camps, hidden behind the country's picturesque mountains and dense forests, have been the epicenter of some of the most chilling human rights infringements in modern history. The inception of the Kwanliso can be traced back to the 1950s under the iron-fisted rule of Kim Il-sung. Intent on consolidating his regime and quashing opposition, Kim established these camps as a tool for political repression. Over the decades, they expanded in number and size, with some estimates suggesting that at their peak, they held over 200,000 prisoners. One of the most notorious among these is Camp 22, located near Horyong, close to the Chinese border. Spanning an area larger than Los Angeles, this camp was a universe unto itself. Anecdotes from defectors paint a grim picture of life within its walls. Prisoners, often incarcerated for the most trivial of reasons, such as listening to foreign radio or making an offhand comment about the regime, found themselves subjected to forced labor, torture, and abysmal living conditions. Shin Dong Hyuk, one of the few known escapees from Camp 14, another infamous Kwan Liso, brought to light the harrowing conditions within. Born inside the camp, Shin's testimony in his memoir, Escape from Camp 14 Inches, reveals the sheer brutality of life in these facilities. From witnessing public executions as a child to being subjected to unimaginable torture, Shin's story is a testament to the depths of human endurance. He once quoted, In the camp, there is no love. We are machines that are just alive. While tales of torture and despair are rife, there are also stories of resistance and hope. At Camp 18, near Bukchang, a curious incident occurred in the 1980s. A group of prisoners, emboldened by sheer desperation, attempted a rare uprising. Although swiftly and brutally suppressed, this act of defiance remains a symbol of the indomitable human spirit. Yet for all their notoriety, there remains a shroud of mystery around the Quan Liso. Satellite imagery, sporadic reports from defectors, and testimonies from former guards provide fragmented glimpses into their operations. Ahn Myong Chol, a former guard at Camp 22, once remarked, It is a place that would make your hair stand on end. Ahn's descriptions of the camp, from its mines where prisoners toiled to its secret burial grounds, underscore the scale and severity of the transgressions occurring within its boundaries. The camps also bore witness to moments of unexpected kindness. In the bleakness of Camp 15, located near Yoduk, two prisoners, having fallen in love, managed to secretly exchange letters using hidden codes. Their story, although ending in tragedy, became a beacon of hope and love in the midst of darkness. The international community for the longest time remained largely unaware of the true extent of the Quan Liso system. It was only in the early 2000s, with the increasing number of defectors reaching South Korea and the West, that their stories began to emerge. A UN Commission of Inquiry in 2014, led by Michael Kirby, shed further light on the situation, comparing the mistreatments to those of Nazi-era atrocities. Echoes in the Square, the terrifying theatre of North Korean public punishments. In the heart of North Korea, 
in bustling town squares and open fields, unfolds a grim spectacle that has, for decades, been a tool of both retribution and control, public executions. The very phrase conjures images of gathered crowds, the chilling silence, and the finality of a life taken as a statement of power. But what drives this macabre theatre, and what reverberations does it send throughout the Hermit Kingdom? The origins of public executions in North Korea can be traced back to the early years of Kim Il-sung's leadership. Intent on solidifying his regime and instilling fear among the populace, public punishments became a tool in his arsenal. The 1960s and 70s, marked by political purges and the tightening grip of the Kim dynasty, saw an uptick in these executions. High-ranking officials like Pak Kum Chol, accused of counter-revolutionary activities, met their end in front of massive crowds, sending a clear message. Dissent would not be tolerated. The locations of these executions were often symbolic. In 1977, Sinchon County became the backdrop for a particularly notorious execution. The county, which had earlier witnessed the Sinchon massacre during the Korean War, saw the public execution of several individuals accused of being American spies. This act was not just a punishment, but also a reminder of the past and a reinforcement of the regime's anti-American stance. These public spectacles were not reserved for the so-called enemies of the state. Ordinary citizens found themselves facing the firing squad for seemingly mundane reasons. An anecdote from the 1990s speaks of a man executed in a village near Chongjin for the crime of selling South Korean videos. His fate was a chilling reminder of the regime's intolerance to foreign influence. A curious aspect of these executions is the mandatory attendance. Residents, including children, were often compelled to witness these events. The intent was clear, to instill fear and ensure compliance. A defector, Jiang Jin-sung, once commented, In North Korea, the spectre of the next public execution is the spectre of your own death. His words capture the pervasive fear these events instilled in the hearts of the North Korean populace. As the 21st century dawned, the world began to get fragmented glimpses into these dark spectacles, thanks to defectors and clandestine recordings. One such recording, from the early 2000s, smuggled out at great risk, showcased a public execution in a remote village near the Chinese border. The criminal was a woman accused of engaging in relations in exchange for money. The chilling commentary of the recording emphasized her moral decay as a justification for her fate. While executions drew international condemnation, another form of public punishment, the self-criticism sessions, remained largely in the shadows. Held in workplaces and neighborhoods, these sessions saw individuals confessing their mistakes and pledging allegiance to the regime. Kim Hyun Sik, a professor who defected in the 1980s, recounted his own experience, describing the sessions as a theater of the absurd where the line between reality and performance blurred. Throughout these dark tales, there emerges a pattern of using public punishment as a tool of control, a spectacle to reinforce the state's narrative. The words of Kim Young Hwan, a South Korean activist who once supported the North but later became disillusioned, encapsulate this theater's essence. In North Korea, fear is a constant companion and public executions are its most visceral manifestation. Silent echoes, the strangled voice of the hermit kingdom. In the bustling streets of Pyongyang, beneath the towering bronze statue of Kim Il-sung, and amidst the colorful parades celebrating the nation's might, lies a story that remains largely untold. It's a narrative of stifled voices, silenced pens, and the invisible chains that bind the citizens of North Korea in a vice grip, stifling their freedom of expression. The roots of this silent oppression can be traced back to the early years of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. As Kim Il-sung consolidated his rule in the late 1940s and 50s, a stringent system of information control began to take shape. The establishment of the Korean Workers' Party newspaper, Rodong Sinmun, marked the beginning of an era where the state would wield absolute control over the narrative. This wasn't just a newspaper, it became the mouthpiece of the regime, echoing its ideologies and directives. As the decades rolled on, the state's grip on information only tightened. By the 1970s, 
Under the watchful eyes of Kim Jong-il, North Korea's media landscape had become a monolithic entity. Every song on the radio, every program on television, and every article in the newspapers were meticulously crafted to serve the state's narrative. An anecdote from this era speaks of a journalist from the Chosun Shinbo, a North Korean publication based in Japan, who mistakenly reported on a minor agricultural setback. The consequences were swift and severe. He was recalled to Pyongyang and never heard from again. This chokehold on information extended beyond the press. The literary and artistic realms weren't spared either. Writers like Han Soria, once celebrated for their works, found themselves falling out of favor and facing dire consequences for perceived dissent. Han's story is particularly poignant. Once a close confidant of Kim Il-sung and author of the acclaimed Jackals, he was later denounced and purged for his supposed counter-revolutionary writings. The 1980s saw the rise of a curious phenomenon, the state-sponsored film industry. While on the surface, it appeared as a medium of entertainment, in reality, it was yet another tool of propaganda. Kim Jong-il, a known cinephile, personally oversaw the production of many films. In a bizarre twist, renowned South Korean director Shin Sang-ok and actress Choi Yoon-hee were allegedly kidnapped in the late 70s to revitalize North Korean cinema. Their eight-year ordeal in the Hermit Kingdom, producing films under Kim's directive, is a testament to the lengths the regime would go to control the narrative. The advent of the internet in the late 20th century posed a new challenge for the North Korean regime. While the rest of the world embraced this new medium, North Korea responded by creating its own walled garden, the Kwang Myong. A domestic-only network, devoid of any external content, it was the state's answer to the information revolution. Yet, for all its efforts, whispers of the outside world began to seep into the nation. Smuggled radios, USB drives filled with foreign content, and illicit Chinese mobile phones became the silent rebels in this information war. Jiang Jin-sung, a former state poet who later defected, once remarked, in North Korea, knowledge is a dangerous pursuit. His own journey, from a celebrated poet in Pyongyang to a defector risking it all for freedom, underscores the perils of seeking truth in a land where silence is mandated. Bound horizons, the invisible fences of the hermit kingdom. In the vast landscapes of North Korea, from the bustling streets of Pyongyang to the serene countryside of Hamgyong, there exists an invisible barrier, one that confines its citizens in more ways than one can fathom. This is not just a story of borders and checkpoints, but of dreams tethered and horizons limited by the omnipresent grip of the state. The tale begins in the aftermath of the Korean War. As the armistice was signed in 1953, a heavily fortified demilitarized zone emerged, physically dividing the Korean peninsula. But beyond this tangible divide, Kim Il-sung's regime began crafting policies that would restrict the movement of its citizens, both within and outside the nation. The 1960s saw the introduction of a domestic passport system, a mechanism that controlled internal migration, especially to the capital city of Pyongyang. Every move, every journey, required state sanction. As North Korea further isolated itself on the global stage, international travel became a privilege reserved for the elite. Diplomats and high-ranking officials, the chosen few permitted to venture abroad, often left behind family members as guarantees of their return. An anecdote from the 1980s speaks of a North Korean diplomat stationed in East Germany, who, sensing an opportunity to defect, found himself torn knowing that his choice would have dire consequences for his loved ones back home. The Tumen and Yalu rivers, meandering along the North Korean-Chinese border, have witnessed countless tales of desperation and hope. They have been both the guardians and gateways for those seeking a life beyond the confines of the Hermit Kingdom. Yet, crossing these waters came at a grave risk. Throughout the 1990s, as famine gripped the nation, there was a surge in defection attempts. Each individual had their own reasons, from seeking food to reuniting with family, or simply the pursuit of freedom. Yet the regime's response was unflinching. Border patrols were intensified, and those caught attempting to defect faced severe punishments, 
ranging from internment in labor camps to public executions. Hyun Seo Lee's story embodies the spirit of countless North Koreans who've risked it all for a glimpse of the world beyond. As a teenager, she crossed the frozen Yalu River into China, embarking on a harrowing journey that would take her across continents. Reflecting on her ordeal, she once said, the darkest place in the world is not a prison camp in North Korea, but the human heart when it loses hope. Her words resonate with the experiences of many defectors who, despite escaping the physical boundaries of North Korea, grapple with the emotional and psychological scars of their past. In recent years, the regime under Kim Jong-un has further tightened restrictions on movement. The once porous border with China now bristles with electric fences and increased surveillance. Yet, in the face of these daunting barriers, the human spirit remains undeterred. Curiously, the North Korean state has often used the narrative of defection for its propaganda. Stories of defectors returning to the embrace of the motherland are showcased, painting a picture of regret and redemption. Whether these tales are genuine or orchestrated remains a matter of debate. Within North Korea's cities and towns, there's a silent acknowledgement of these restrictions. The songs on the radio, the stories in the newspapers, and the propaganda posters adorning the streets all speak of the nation's glory and the outside world's perils. Yet beneath this facade, there's an undercurrent of curiosity. Secret gatherings where foreign films are screened, covert radio broadcasts tuning into South Korean channels, and whispered tales of the world beyond are all testament to the boundless human desire to explore and experience. Chains unseen, the far-reaching tendrils of North Korea's forced labor. In the shadowed corners of the world, from the dense forests of Russia's Far East to the scorching deserts of the Middle East, a tale of relentless toil and unseen shackles unfolds. This is the story of North Korea's forced laborers, sent far from their homeland's confines, working tirelessly not for their dreams, but for the ambitions of a distant regime. The origins of this labor diaspora trace back to the Cold War era. With North Korea forging alliances with fellow communist nations, the 1960s saw the first wave of North Koreans traveling to countries like the Soviet Union. Ostensibly there to learn and bring back skills to their homeland, many found themselves in labor camps, working in logging industries in places like Siberia, the biting cold, coupled with grueling work hours, became their daily reality. As the decades progressed, the scale and scope of this labor export expanded. The 1980s, marked by economic downturns and food shortages in North Korea, saw an increased push to send workers abroad. Their destinations varied from logging camps in Russia to construction sites in the Middle East. Anecdotes from this era tell of North Koreans working on massive construction projects in countries like Libya and Iraq. In the sweltering heat, they toiled day and night, building monuments and infrastructure that stood in stark contrast to their own nation's crumbling edifices. And one might wonder what drove these individuals to endure such hardships in foreign lands. The answer lies in the intricate web of control spun by the North Korean regime. Workers were often hand-picked not just for their skills, but for their perceived loyalty to the state. Once abroad, their movements were closely monitored by state-appointed minders, ensuring no dissent or attempts to defect. A significant portion of their meager earnings was sent back to North Korea, filling the state's coffers and financing its ambitions. Kim Tae-jin, a former manager at a North Korean trading company, once revealed the dark underbelly of this labor export. Reflecting on his time overseeing workers in Africa, he recounted, They were modern-day slaves, toiling not for themselves, but for a distant master. His words echo the sentiments of many who've witnessed or been part of this labor diaspora. The turn of the century brought with it new destinations and challenges. With international sanctions tightening their grip on North Korea, the regime sought novel avenues to earn foreign currency. Reports emerged of North Koreans working in textile factories in China, mines in Africa, and even restaurants in Southeast Asia. These establishments, often bearing the facade of regular businesses, were in reality state-run enterprises. 
customers dining in North Korean restaurants in cities like Beijing or Bangkok were often oblivious to the fact that the smiling waitresses serving them were in many ways prisoners in plain sight. A curious aspect of this labor export is the cultural exchange it inadvertently fostered. Workers, while isolated, weren't entirely cut off from the local populace. Stories of friendships forged, romances blossoming, and quiet acts of kindness by locals paint a picture of humanity amidst the bleakness. Yet, as tales of these forced laborers began to seep into global consciousness, the international community took note. The United Nations in the 2010s raised concerns about the exploitation and human rights breaches faced by these workers. Countries began tightening regulations, and many businesses, wary of international backlash, started severing ties with North Korean labor. Whispers of empty bowls, the hunger chronicles of North Korea. In the verdant landscapes of North Korea, where rice fields stretch to the horizon and mountains stand sentinel, there lurks a paradox. This land, abundant in natural beauty, has witnessed the haunting specter of hunger, casting its shadow over the lives of its people. The tale of North Korea's tryst with food insecurity is not just one of empty bowls and barren fields, but of policies, politics, and a resilience that defies the odds. The 1990s stand as a somber chapter in this narrative. Often referred to as the arduous march, these years bore witness to a devastating famine that claimed the lives of countless North Koreans. The causes were manifold, a combination of unfavorable weather patterns, outdated agricultural practices, and the collapse of the Soviet Union, a key trading partner. But underlying these immediate triggers were decades of domestic policies that prioritized military spending over food security. Anecdotes from this era paint a heart-wrenching picture. In the city of Chongjin, tales circulated of families foraging for wild grasses and tree bark, desperate to eke out a meal. In the capital, Pyongyang, once insulated from the nation's hardships, whispers of hunger began to emerge. A defector, Kang Chol Huan, recounted his grandmother's words during those trying times. Even in the darkest days, we must never forget our pride as Koreans. Her sentiment encapsulated the spirit of many who, despite the odds, clung to hope and national pride. As the famine raged on, international aid began pouring in. Organizations like the World Food Programme initiated relief efforts, bringing much-needed sustenance to the starving populace. Yet the distribution of this aid became a subject of contention. Reports emerged of the regime diverting food supplies to the military and the elite, leaving the most vulnerable still grappling with hunger. The turn of the century brought with it new challenges. International sanctions imposed in response to North Korea's nuclear ambitions further strained the nation's food resources. While the sanctions targeted the regime's military endeavors, their ripple effects were felt most acutely by the common people. The city of Sinuiju, a key trading hub on the border with China, saw its markets dwindle as trade restrictions tightened. Yet amidst these adversities, the resilience of the North Korean people shone through. Grassroots innovations began to emerge. In the absence of chemical fertilizers, farmers in the Hamgyong province experimented with organic farming techniques, tapping into age-old knowledge passed down through generations. Urban dwellers turned to balcony gardens, growing vegetables and herbs in any available space. A curious phenomenon during these years was the rise of informal markets, known as Jiang Madang. While officially frowned upon, these markets became lifelines for many, offering a platform to trade goods and services. A story from the city of Hayezen speaks of a woman, once a schoolteacher, turning to the Yang Madang to trade homemade tofu. Her enterprise not only sustained her family, but also earned her the moniker Tofu Queen among locals. While the regime often credited its self-reliance policy or jush for any agricultural success, the reality was a testament to the indomitable spirit of its people. The words of Lee Soon Okay, a former prisoner who later testified about her experiences, resonate deeply. She remarked, Hunger knows no ideology or border. In its face we are all but humans seeking a morsel to survive. Behind the sterile facade, navigating North Korea's healthcare labyrinth, amidst the grandeur of Pyongyang's towering monuments 
and meticulously manicured parks lies an intricate maze of hospitals, clinics, and healthcare facilities. On the surface, they stand as testaments to North Korea's commitment to its citizens' well-being, but delve a little deeper and a more complex narrative unravels, weaving tales of resilience, innovation, and the indomitable human spirit. The foundation of North Korea's healthcare system was laid in the aftermath of the Korean War. With the country in ruins, Kim Il-sung embarked on an ambitious mission to provide free healthcare to all. The 1960s saw the establishment of the Pyongyang Medical College, a beacon of hope aiming to train a new generation of medical professionals. The state's narrative spoke of miraculous recoveries, pioneering surgeries and healthcare innovations. Yet, as often is the case, reality painted a different picture. As the decades rolled on, the cracks in the system began to surface. The economic downturns of the 1980s, coupled with the collapse of the Soviet Union, a key ally and aid provider, strained the healthcare infrastructure. Hospitals, once equipped with the latest machinery, now grappled with power outages and equipment shortages. Anecdotes from this era speak volumes. In the city of Ham Hung, a doctor recounted performing surgeries under candlelight, relying on his intuition and experience in the absence of modern diagnostic tools. The arduous march of the 1990s, marked by famine and food shortages, further exacerbated the healthcare crisis. Malnutrition-related diseases surged, and previously eradicated ailments like tuberculosis made a grim comeback. The city of Wonsan witnessed a particularly harrowing outbreak of cholera, a stark reminder of the deteriorating sanitation conditions. Yet, in the face of these adversities, the North Korean spirit shone through. Local communities rallied together with neighborhood clinics, known as Rai clinics, emerging as grassroots solutions. Run by local healthcare workers, these clinics often relied on traditional Korean medicine, tapping into age-old remedies passed down through generations. The turn of the century brought with it new challenges and opportunities. International organizations, recognizing the dire healthcare situation, began extending aid. The World Health Organization, in collaboration with local authorities, launched initiatives targeting tuberculosis and malaria, two of the country's most pressing health concerns. But perhaps the most intriguing aspect of North Korea's healthcare journey is the rise of the black market, or Jiang Madang medicine. With state-run facilities often lacking essential medicines, many turned to these informal markets for relief. From painkillers to antibiotics, these markets offered a ray of hope for many. A tale from Sinuiju speaks of a medicine auntie, an elderly woman known for her uncanny ability to procure even the rarest of medicines. Her little stall, tucked away in a bustling market, became a beacon of hope for many. Amidst this intricate healthcare tapestry, stories of resilience and innovation emerge. Dr. Ri Chol, a surgeon from the Pyongyang Medical University Hospital, gained renown for his innovative surgical techniques, often crafted out of necessity due to equipment shortages. His mantra, innovation is born out of adversity, resonated with many of his peers. Silent hymns in hidden corners, the test of faith in the hermit kingdom. Deep within the enigmatic heart of North Korea, where state anthems resonate and portraits of the eternal leaders gaze from every corner, there exists a story of faith whispered in hushed tones and practiced in secret alcoves. It is a tale of devotion and defiance, of silent hymns sung in hidden corners, and of believers who, despite the looming shadow of persecution, hold on to their faith with unwavering tenacity. The history of religion in North Korea is as intricate as its political landscape. Before the Korean War's ashes settled and the nation took its current shape, Pyongyang, now the capital, was often referred to as the Jerusalem of the East. It was a vibrant hub for Christianity, with churches dotting its skyline and missionaries actively spreading their message. But as the Kim dynasty took root, with Kim Il-sung at the helm, the narrative began to shift. By the 1960s, the regime's stance on religion had crystallized. The state, viewing religious beliefs as a potential threat to its hegemony, began a systematic campaign to suppress religious practices. Churches, temples and other places of worship were repurposed or razed, 
their once echoing hymns replaced with state propaganda. The Constitution, while ostensibly guaranteeing freedom of religion, was but a facade. In practice, any religious activity outside state-sanctioned churches was deemed subversive. Yet, the human spirit's resilience in the face of adversity knows no bounds. Stories began to emerge, whispered tales of secret congregations and covert prayer meetings. An elderly woman from Ham Hung, recounting tales from her youth, spoke of midnight masses held in dimly lit basements where believers would gather, their voices barely rising above a whisper as they shared scriptures and sang hymns. Another anecdote from the 1980s tells of a priest from Raisin who, in the absence of a church, turned his humble abode into a sanctuary holding clandestine services for a close-knit group of believers. But practicing faith in the shadows came at a grave risk. The state's surveillance apparatus, with its intricate network of informants, was always on the lookout for deviant activities. Those found practicing religion outside the state's purview often faced dire consequences. From internment in labor camps to public executions, the regime's response was swift and ruthless. A quote from a defector Kim Yun Jung resonates deeply with the experiences of many. In the land of the Kims, faith is the greatest rebellion. The plight of religious groups wasn't limited to Christians. Buddhists, once a significant part of Korea's religious tapestry, found their practices stifled. Historical temples, some dating back centuries, were relegated to mere tourist attractions, their spiritual essence stripped away. Anecdotes from the 1990s speak of monks from the Myohyang Mountains practicing their rituals in secret, often under the cover of night. Yet, amidst this grim landscape, there were occasional glimmers of hope. International diplomacy sometimes paved the way for brief religious exchanges. The early 2000s saw a South Korean delegation, comprising religious leaders, making a historic visit to Pyongyang. Their trip culminated in a joint service a rare spectacle where hymns of peace and unity resonated in a land where faith was often silenced. Today, the state's narrative on religion remains tightly controlled. State-sanctioned churches in Pyongyang, while operational, are often viewed with skepticism, with many believing them to be mere showpieces for foreign visitors. Yet, beyond the state's watchful gaze, in the hidden nooks and crannies of the nation, faith endures. Echoes from a silenced world, the iron curtain of North Korean information. In the bustling digital age, where information flows like water and global connectivity is but a fingertip away, there exists a land where time seems to have paused, where the outside world's echoes are but faint murmurs, muffled by an iron curtain of control. This is North Korea, a realm where the state's narrative reigns supreme, and the vast expanse of global knowledge is reduced to a mere trickle. The genesis of North Korea's information isolation can be traced back to its formative years. As Kim Il-sung solidified his grip on the nascent nation in the 1950s, he recognized the power of information. A controlled narrative, he believed, was the linchpin to ensuring unwavering loyalty. Thus began the regime's meticulous efforts to craft a state-sanctioned version of reality. Radios and televisions, newly introduced to the Korean peninsula, were modified to receive only state-run channels. The city of Sinuiju, with its proximity to China, became an early focus, with authorities ensuring that no foreign broadcasts could permeate its airwaves. As the decades rolled on and technology advanced, the regime's stranglehold on information only tightened. The advent of the Internet in the late 20th century posed a new challenge. While countries worldwide embraced this new medium, North Korea approached it with caution. By the early 2000s, the nation had developed its own intranet, known as Kwang Myong. A walled garden of sorts, Kwang Myong offered a curated glimpse of the digital realm, with content meticulously vetted by state authorities. Yet, human curiosity knows no bounds. Anecdotes from the 1990s and 2000s speak of clandestine listening parties in cities like Hyacin. Huddled in dimly lit rooms, individuals would tune into foreign broadcasts, their ears straining to catch whispers of the world beyond. A defector, Park Ji Hyun, once recounted her experiences of secretly listening to South Korean radio. 
In those stolen moments, she mused, I traveled a world I'd never seen. The regime, ever watchful, wasn't oblivious to these covert activities. The 2010S saw a renewed crackdown on illegal radios and other communication devices. Border towns, with their potential access to Chinese mobile networks, were particularly scrutinized. A quote from a state directive around this time encapsulated the regime's stance. To protect our style of socialism, we must guard against the enemy's airwaves. Yet, the information age brought with it unexpected challenges for the North Korean regime. Flash drives, small and easily concealable, began making their way into the country. These tiny devices, often smuggled in from China, carried a trove of content, from South Korean dramas to global news. The city of Rajin became a hub for this underground trade, with stories of flash drive barons who, risking the regime's wrath, sought to quench their compatriots' thirst for knowledge. Amidst this backdrop of control and defiance, tales of resilience emerge. Universities in Pyongyang, catering to the elite, occasionally offered glimpses of the global internet. An account from a former student spoke of surreptitious online sessions where, under the guise of research, he'd explore the vast digital realms, marvelling at the world's wonders. In this intricate dance of control and curiosity, the state and its citizens continue to navigate the challenges of the information age. While the regime's narrative, broadcasted from the towering Ryugyong Hotel's antennas, seeks to mould reality, whispered tales shared in hushed tones, speak of a world beyond the Iron Curtain, of dreams, hopes, and a yearning to connect with the global tapestry of knowledge. Journeys beyond the Northern Star, tales of escape from the Hermit Kingdom. In the vast tapestry of human narratives, there exist tales that defy imagination, stories of courage, determination, and the relentless pursuit of freedom. Among the most poignant of these are the accounts of North Korean defectors, individuals who, driven by hope and desperation, embarked on perilous journeys, seeking a life beyond the watchful eyes of the Hermit Kingdom. The 1980s marked a turning point in the annals of defection. The world's attention was riveted on the story of Kang Chol Hwan, a young man who, after spending a decade in the Yodok concentration camp, managed to flee North Korea and eventually penned the aquariums of Pyongyang, shedding light on the regime's darkest corners. Kang's journey, fraught with danger, took him across the Tumen River into China and eventually to South Korea. But his tales of the Yodok camp's horrors were what truly resonated, illuminating the depths of the regime's cruelty. Yet every defector's tale is unique, each marked by its own set of challenges and triumphs. The bustling markets of Horyong in the 1990s were abuzz with whispered tales of Lee soon ok -ke, a former prison guard who, disillusioned with the regime, chose the path of defection. Her narrative, chronicled in Eyes of the Tailless Animals, became a testament to the complexities of life in North Korea, where loyalty to the state and personal morality often found themselves at odds. As the new millennium dawned, the journeys of defectors took on new dimensions. The tale of Park Yonmi, a young woman from Hyesan, captured global attention. Fleeing starvation and oppression, Park's journey took her across the Gobi Desert, guided only by the Northern Star and her indomitable spirit. Her memoir, In Order to Live, spoke not just of escape, but of the challenges of adapting to a new life in the bustling metropolis of Seoul, Yet, not all journeys ended in freedom. The border town of Musan in the early 2000s was rife with tales of brokers who, for a price, promised safe passage out of North Korea. While many defectors found their way to safety through these intermediaries, others were not so fortunate. Stories of betrayal of individuals handed back to North Korean authorities served as grim reminders of the perils of defection. Amidst these tales of escape, stories of resilience and adaptation emerge. Jiang Jin Sung, once a state poet, lauded by Kim Jong Il himself, found himself on the run after an unauthorized book from the South found its way into his hands. His eventual escape and subsequent life in Seoul, where he founded the dissident publication 
New Focus International, is a testament to the human spirit's adaptability. The city of Pyongyang, in a rare moment of transparency, once hosted an international press conference in 2016, parading a young man named Kim Ryan Hui. Kim's tale was a curious one. Having defected to the south, she spoke of her desire to return to the north, painting a rosy picture of life under the Kim regime. Yet her tearful pleas, broadcasted for the world to see, left many questioning the veracity of her claims. In the intricate dance of defection, where tales of hope and despair intertwine, a quote from the famed defector Hyun Seo Lee resonates deeply. The darkest place in the world is not a prison camp in North Korea. It's the human heart that looks away. Voices in concert, the world's chorus on North Korea's silent cry. In the intricate theater of global politics, where nations play their parts, guided by diplomacy and strategy, there emerges a narrative that transcends borders and ideologies. It is the story of the world's response to the enigma of North Korea, a nation shrouded in mystery, its tales of suffering echoing in the hallowed halls of international assemblies. The 1990s marked the beginning of the global community's concerted efforts to address North Korea's human rights situation. As whispers of the arduous march, the devastating famine that gripped the nation, reached foreign shores, the world began to take notice. The United Nations, that bastion of global cooperation, took the lead. In 1995, the World Food Programme, an arm of the UN, initiated one of its most extensive relief operations, funneling food aid into the heart of North Korea, hoping to alleviate the suffering of its starving populace. Yet, as the new millennium dawned, the focus shifted from immediate humanitarian concerns to the broader landscape of human rights. Reports, trickling out from defectors and secret informants, painted a grim picture of life in the Hermit Kingdom. Tales of political prisons, public executions, and rampant persecution echoed in the chambers of the United Nations Human Rights Council. In 2003, Vitit Muntaborn, a renowned Thai jurist, was appointed as the UN's Special Rapporteur on North Korea. His mandate, though met with resistance from Pyongyang, was clear – to shed light on the human rights situation and chart a path towards resolution. The international response wasn't limited to just institutions. Nations, moved by the tales emanating from North Korea, began to play their parts. South Korea, with its unique position as the North's sibling, walked a delicate tightrope. While the sunshine policy of the late 1990s and the early 2000s, championed by President Kim Dae-jung, sought reconciliation and cooperation, subsequent administrations, wary of the North's actions, adopted a more cautious approach. Yet, amidst this political dance, tales of Hanawan, a resettlement center south of Seoul, spoke of the nation's efforts to help defectors from the North integrate into South Korean society. Across the Pacific, the United States, often at loggerheads with North Korea on the nuclear front, took steps to address the human rights situation. The North Korean Human Rights Act of 2004, signed into law by President George W. Bush, aimed to promote human rights, democracy and freedom of information in North Korea. Yet a quote from the act resonated deeply. The promotion of human rights is not only a moral imperative, but also a necessary component of any comprehensive and lasting solution to the North Korean nuclear problem. Europe, too, lent its voice to the chorus. The European Union, in concert with Japan, took the lead in tabling resolutions at the United Nations, calling for accountability and transparency from the North Korean regime. Notable figures like Carl Bildt, former Prime Minister of Sweden, echoed these sentiments, emphasizing the need for a global, unified response. Yet the journey wasn't without its challenges. North Korea, with its characteristic defiance, often rebuffed these efforts, dismissing them as imperialist propaganda. An anecdote from the early 2010s speaks of a North Korean diplomat at the United Nations, who, in response to a resolution on human rights, quipped, it's nothing but a product of political confrontation and plot against my country. As the sun sets over the horizon of the Korean peninsula, casting long shadows that veil the heart of North Korea, we reflect on the tales of resilience, defiance, and the silent cries echoing from this enigmatic land. 
From the haunting corridors of political prisons to the whispered hymns of faith, North Korea remains a testament to the indomitable spirit of its people. As we stand on the precipice of history, peering into the depths of these atrocities, we're reminded of the poignant words of Eli Wiesel, Holocaust survivor and Nobel laureate. There may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. Let this journey be our protest, our call to the world, to ensure that the tales of the silenced are never forgotten.